Hare Krishna. Welcome to our Gita study course. Now we are discussing the middle of the ninth, the Gita, the ninth chapter. And today we'll discuss one of the more controversial aspects of the Gita's teachings. And the topic we'll discuss is Gita say about social caste the caste system and social justice at large okay sorry so this will be based on 932 in the bhagavad gita maam hi parth vyapa shritya ye pisyu papa yona yaha striyo vaishya satha shudras te piyanti param gatim So, Maam hi partha vyapashitya. Krishna says that those who take shelter of me, he certainly. Ye pisyu papa yonayaha. Even if they are born in lower species. Papa means low born species, uh, unrighteous species. And striyo vaishyas dhashudra stepi yanti param gatim that even they be women, Vaishyas or Shudras, the Yanti Tepi, even they can attain the supreme perfection. Yanti Param Gatim. So I'll discuss this in broadly three parts today. We'll look at the caste system as it is known in today's terminology. What was its intention and how, what we have in modern times is a distortion. Then we will look at statements from scripture that seem discriminatory so and then we'll look at lastly about equality in principle and practice so let's look at this now the first point to recognize is that although we live in an egalitarian society we need a hierarchy for any kind of functioning every functional society needs a hierarchy based on competence to tackle life's many problems. So if, if we have a group of people who need food, we could say everybody is equal, but not everybody is equally good at cooking. So if a person who is good at, good at cooking, if they are put in charge and they take charge and others follow them, there's a hierarchy form, but that hierarchy is beneficial for everyone because everybody will get good food. But the key here is the hierarchy has to be based on competence. Now, instead the hierarchy is based simply on power or privilege. So somebody says, I'm the head cook because I'm, I'm the oldest, I'm the wealthiest, I'm the physically the strongest. Well, that may not lead to good food. So but the point is that in every area of life, we do need hierarchy. So, Varanashram, as the original system that was there in India for thousands of years was known, that is, in intention, it was a hierarchy based on competence. Its purpose was that different people with their different competencies can cooperate. The purpose was not as it has happened in today's system, it was not discrimination based on birth. So, Varana refers to the occupational, divo, div, occupational division and ashram refers to, we could say, a uh, life stage division. So we'll focus today on the occupational division. And the example that is given in the Vedic literature, and it's reiterated in the Bhagavatam also, is of a social body. That a body has different parts. Say, for example, relevant over here the body has head arms belly and legs now each area of the body has its own competency what the legs can do the head can't do what the belly can do the hands can't do so all the if all the parts of the body 
play their role in the whole body functions effectively. So similarly, society is compared to a body where the Brahmanas are said to be the head, the Kshatriyas are the arms, the Vaishyas are the belly, and the Shudras are the feet. So there is a natural division of labor based on competency. So broadly speaking, the Brahmanas are the, we could say the ministerial class, not the minister in the political sense, minister in the religious sense. So they're, they're the priests, the teachers, the advisors. So, so they play a particular and vital role in society. The Kshatriyas are the warriors. They are the people who are the martial guardians of society. They may do it directly by fighting or soldiers or warriors, or they can do it by administration. That is the statesmen, the diplomats. And then, so now that just as if something, if, uh, if the body is attacked, the first resource that we usually use for protecting the body is our hands. So similarly, the Kshatriyas are meant to protect the whole body. The head is meant to guide the whole body. So when the Brahmanas guide the whole body, but the belly is what nourishes the body. So the, for any functional society, money, wealth is required and the wealth generators are the Vaishyas. So they are the Krushi Goraksha Vanijyam, the Bhagavad Gita says that their professions are farming, cow protection and business. So basically they are the wealth generators and just as the belly provides food for the whole body, the Vaishyas are the primary wealth generators who provide wealth for the, who generate and provide wealth for the whole body, for, for the whole of society. And the Shudras are like the feet. So the feet carries the body around. So the, so the Vaishyas are general assistants who perform various activities to assist society. Now, <clears throat> here, this metaphor focuses on cooperation, how the different limbs of the body cooperate. Similarly, different people in society, they cooperate for the overall functioning of society. Now, if we consider just from a a non-functional perspective. Non-functional means that somebody might argue why is the head higher and the feet lower. But that is that argument doesn't consider the fact that the body is not just an ornament meant for demonstrating a particular value. The body is a tool for serving a particular purpose. So I repeat, the body is not just an ornament for demonstrating a particular value. The body is a tool meant to serve a particular purpose. The body is meant to function uh, so that the human living being, the human being can survive and thrive. Similarly, society is meant not just to demonstrate certain values. The, the, the society is meant to do something of value. People in society, so people in society need to recognize that equality is itself not the supreme value. Equality is meant to help us do something of value. So, yes, from a from a if if we consider from a non-functional perspective, why should the head be higher and the legs be lower? But from a functional perspective, that's where they fit. And if the body is to function, that's the best way that they are placed. So similarly, the underlying idea is that that from a functional perspective, society is meant to do certain things. Now, this is, doesn't, uh, society is meant to basically, there are certain needs that are to be meant, 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 meant by society and each Social, social, social limb or social group, if it finds a role according to its, its particular uh, position, 
then it can function optimally. So now what are the basic principle underlying Varanashram? That spiritually everyone is equal, but materially everyone is different. And materially, if we try to say, we, we claim that everybody is equal. No, say not everybody is equally good at fighting. Not everybody is equally good at uh, intellectual analysis. Not everybody is good at equally good at practical skills or not everybody is equally good at making money. So people are different. And here there are in the in this Vedic text, this is a given truth that at a functional at a at a essential level, everybody is equal, but at a functional level, everybody is different. And quite often the system of Varanashram as it degenerated the caste system, it is uh, it has been seen as a source of great, uh, uh, great as we seen as a source of a great social evil, and that's true. But still, it serves some purpose. So uh, here I have some uh, two three quotes from some Western thinkers who observed India. So Mark Tully is a BBC correspondent. He wrote several books. So he says over here about the superficiality of egalitarianism. What happened over here? So, yeah. Hmm. The alienation of many young people in the West and the loneliness of the old show the suffering that egalitarianism inflicts on those who do not win. The superficiality of an egalitarianism, which in effect means equal opportunities for all to win and then ignores the inevitable losers. So we may say that everybody is equal, but the problem is that everybody is not equal. Say if a society like today's society uh, at, uh, highlights uh, academic success and everybody should be equal. That's good. Everybody is equal in principle. But students who from their birth or children from birth have a low IQ. Now what happens to them? Now they grow throughout their education system feeling inferior, inadequate, and then they end up losers. No matter how hard somebody students may study, or some students may just have, out, may have outstanding capacity to remember. And some remember especially facts and uh, mathematical tables and stuff like that and uh, some students may have an outstanding capacity to forget that kind of things they may remember they may be good at other things but they forget that so a society which imposes equality uh, but then what happens it it ignores the inevitable losers so it actually ends up creating inferiority insecurity inadequacy for all that the elite of india have become so spellbound by egalitarianism that they are unable to see any good in the only institution which does provide a sense of identity and dignity to those who are robbed from birth of the opportunity to compete on an equal footing that is caste. So here it's a very important point that some people are robbed from birth of the opportunity to compete on an equal footing. Let's consider IQ itself. Uh, while IQ is not necessarily a, param uh, a parameter for determining a, a, a happy life or even a necessarily a successful life, oh, but IQ is a fairly good predictor of academic success. So the fact is that reality itself, life itself is not, uh, doesn't offer tribute to the ideal of equality in a sentimental way. We may, we may believe that everybody is equal, but with respect to say uh, IQ, people are not equal. So they are robbed from birth by the opportunity to compete on equal footing. There could be so many other areas. Say if for example, if we, had, if we lived in a society that was constantly at war and now, there were societies like this in the past. Even now, <clears throat> there are wars going on in some parts of the world. But if we look at history, 
there are there are times when say <clears throat> a country is said to have a unprecedented time of prosperity sorry at a time of peace and what was the time of peace that was for 20 years that is 20 years they didn't have a war otherwise constantly this 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 was this state was fighting against that state and this was somebody was attacking somebody was plundering so imagine a society if it was primarily either uh, defending against invaders or itself invading then naturally those who were physically well built they would be considered the best and all those people who did not have that kind of physical build but they would be deprived if somebody was say physically limited in some way physically constrained physically somebody with a spe uh, special needs so then they would not be able to function at all or they would be disqualified in that society so the point is that birth it's we may want equality but birth itself can be discriminatory so rather than having one definition of success for all of society varanashram created different hierarchies and that brings us to the next point over here so gerald heard in his book man the master calls varanashram as organic democracy the rule of the people who have organized themselves in a living and not a mechanical relationship where instead of all men being said to be equal which is a lie all men are known to be of equal value could we but find the position in which their potential contribution could be released and their essential growth so pursued so here of course men is used in a inclusive sense for to refer to all of humanity just like man proposes god disposes there was no uh, no gender sense it was gender inclusive reference to humanity at that time in the past but the point here is that to say that everybody is equal is just not true factually it's it's a lie so people are again organized in a living not a mechanical relationship a living relationship means that as i talked about the society the body has to function and for the body to function okay how can each part contribute all men are known to be of equal value that means everybody has something value valuable to contribute if they can if where they can contribute is found out so these four four varanas they they rather than thinking of them as four castes we can think of them as four human types four human types that means there are some people who are naturally of a brahmanical orientation there are some people who are more of a kshatriya orientation there are some people who like to manage delegate organize there are some people who like to analyze study teach there are some people who like to trade and earn on money now everybody needs money but some people that's what they delight in primarily and some people I have skills by which they can assist others so their potential contribution can be released and the essential growth pursued if they all can contribute where they can contribute is found so i earlier talked about a hierarchy so rather than having one hierarchy like say in the today's education system everybody goes through the same education system now i'm not criticizing the education system per se but i'm just recognizing pointing out that there are certain limitations if everybody is to be tested based solely on iq and those who are not that good at iq they will not be able to succeed and thrive so if instead of having one hierarchy there are multiple hierarchies and everybody is fit okay you 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 fit into this hierarchy and then you rise in this hierarchy and then if they rise in that hierarchy as albert einstein is attributed to have said that a fish should not be judged by its ability to climb a tree so similarly it's not necessary to judge everybody by the same set of parameters now often the caste system is talked about as being discriminatory but actually it served another purpose of creating a belonging to a bigger whole so there is no doubt that it caste is the main cause of this is uh, sydney law in his book a vision of india there is no doubt that it caste is the main cause of the fundamental stability and contentment 
by which Indian society has been braced for centuries against the shocks of politics and the cataclysms of nature. It provides every man with his place, his career, his occupations, a circle of friends. It makes him at the outset a member of a corporate body. It protects him through life from a, the canker of social jealousy and unfulfilled aspirations. So now, before I go, what, what does this mean? Let's look at the first sentence that now sometimes it's been perceived as the caste system has been so horribly discriminatory. Now, no doubt it has been discriminatory. However, if we consider people from all castes have still lived on and lived on for centuries. If you consider all the ancient civilizations, hardly any one of them is existing now at all. If we go to modern day Egypt, it has nothing to do with the Egypt, Egyptian civilization where the pharaohs and others were there. If you look at the Mayan civilization, Aztec civilization, Mesopotamian civilization, they don't exist at all. Now, if you consider Chinese civilization, there is hardly much of ancient China in today's China. In India, it's probably the world's only ancient civilization which is continuing till today. Of course, there are changes, but there is a remarkable sense of cultural continuity also. So now, why was there so much resilience? India has been repeatedly attacked by invaders. So any system that is ex that is excessively discriminatory, sooner or later people revolt against it. And especially when there is external aggression to support that in, in internal resent internal uh, revolt or internal urge for resent revo reformation, then the system itself collapses. But it didn't collapse. Why? Because. It served, a, the, the, uh, the Indian society didn't collapse because Varanashram served a purpose. And what was that purpose? That it, pro, it provided a grouping of like-minded people. So if you, if you visit India, you'll see in certain parts of India, there are, there's one area where all groups of people with similar shops are there. So all say a particular area, area has, has the shop of carpenters, a particular area has shops of say sweet sellers. Now, of course, then we distribute also, but there are areas where people, this is just physically coming together, but it's more of a community coming together. That's what Varanashram was. So rather than getting a person who is an intellectual to compete with a person who is a business person, and then and if the parameter for competing becomes money, then the intellectual will never feel satisfied because intellectuals don't earn usually as much money as business people do. So it protects him through life from the canker of social jealousy, social jealousy. And oh, why is this so? If every person finds out the hierarchy, which they can best rise through their skills, then they can have a sense of achievement. They can also have a sense of belonging among like-minded people and they can avoid unnecessary jealousy. It ensures in companionship and a sense of community with others in like case with himself. The caste, the caste organization is to the Hindu, his club, his trade union, his benefit society, his philanthropic society. So the idea is that it, while there is a division in terms of different different castes, there is also a coming together a union within one caste, and thus it created a sense of belonging also. Now, of course, here the word caste is sometimes used interchangeably with Paranashram, but the idea is whatever the term be used, we are looking at the concept. The concept itself was uh, something which was meant for cooperation, not for division or discrimination, not for discrimination. Now, how did we look at the intention? Now, how did it go wrong basically? So it became wrong because of birthright. Birthright made it wrong. So this is actually a danger in any hierarchy that the hierarchy can be formed because of competence, but the hierarchy can become corrupted when it, it, it becomes based on extraneous consideration apart from competence. So what happened was the lower, the higher castes started claiming power and privilege and prestige 
just based on being born in that higher caste. So Brahmanas, for example, or Kshatriyas, they started claiming privilege. But that's an oversimplified understanding. That's an oversimplified understanding to being distorted. So now birth, it can be an aid for gaining qualification. But birth itself is not the qualification. So if you consider a doctor, if a child is born uh, in a doctor's family, where say the where the husband, the wife, both of them are doctors, then what happens? Then there is a there is an atmosphere where the child can maybe ch uh, child can learn from medic about medicine right from childhood, and the child might find it easier to become a doctor. But that doesn't mean that the child is automatically a doctor. That doesn't mean that the, if the father falls sick, the child can just go into the clinic and start off, start uh, administering medication. The child has to go through the requisite training, and child has to demonstrate that as the child has grow, grows, that they have they have developed the adequate qualifications. So the problem is that birth can be one factor, but birth is not the sole factor. So Chatur Varane Maya Sushtam Guna Karma Vibhaga Shaha. Krishna says that these, div these divisions for Varanas was by Guna and Karma, by um, qualities and activities, not by, it, Krishna doesn't say that is by Janma, by birth. So now we look at statements in scriptures that seem discriminatory. How do we make sense of them? So for example, this verse itself says, uses the word papayonayaha. Papayonaya, low born, and then it gives a list of striyo vaishya sata shudras. Tepiyanti paramgatim, that even they can attain the supreme perfection. Now, this verse has been translated differently by different, different uh, commentators. Mami ye pisu papa yonaya, striyo vaishya sta shudra, stepi anti parangati. So many commentators have here referred to papa yonaya as a fourth category. So striya vaishya shudra and papa yonaya. So papa yonaya, for example, Vedanta Deshika, a prominent commentator in the Sri Vaishnava tradition, says that this actually refers even to non human species. That even if they practice bhakti, they can become elevated. Or it can refer to people who are outside the traditional purview of an ashram. So that I do. now when we talk about varanashram, <clears throat> this is an organic division of society. So at one level, in any society, there will be people who will be uh, having some intellectual inclinations, having some managerial inclinations, having some mercantile inclinations, having some mechanical inclinations. Mechanical means doing mechanical skills and mechanical activities, specializations. So there will be uh, people with all these naturally in any society. But at the same time, the Varanashram conveys a certain amount of training. And if the training is not there, then there are certain people who are considered to be outside the fold of Varanashram. So they are considered Papa Yonayaha. So it can refer to people who are outside Varanashram. But even if so, so if that is the case, then there is no discrimination uh, in this sense about the low about the caste which are considered lower. But if we consider Papa Yonaya to be like a describer as it is in this translation, then women, Vaishyas, merchants, and Shudras, workers. So now, what is going on over here? Why are, is this a discriminatory statement that say certain groups of people, the women, Vaishyas and Shudras, they are considered to be low born. So let's look at this. There are statements like this, which can seem discriminatory. So let's see how we can understand those statements. Yeah. So broadly, we'll talk about three different ways of looking at this. First is that everything in scripture is not necessarily the teaching of scripture. Say for example, if a demon like Hiranyakashipu tells other demons that 
So if we stop the yagyas, if we destroy the people who are competent enough for performing yagyas, the brahmanas, then by that the devatas will die, and if the devatas die, the Vish Vishnu will eventually become weak and die. So Hiranyakashipu says that in the seventh canto of the Shrimad Bhagavatam. Now it is not true. Vishnu is immortal. He is not going to die. So although this statement is coming in scripture, we have to see uh, scripture often contains stories and stories have a particular context. So if in a particular context something is spoken, we have to see who is speaking and is that person an authority speaking, uh, speaking a spiritual truth. It may not be so. So everything in scripture is not necessarily the teaching of scripture. So that's why we can't just isolate scriptural statements from their context and look at their meaning. We need to see the statements in context. So who is speaking is important to say. And further, it, not only that, there are certain statements in the scripture which are descriptive and not prescriptive. So what do we mean by descriptive and non-prescriptive? That some, while scripture's core message is transcendental, that message is spoken at a particular time in history. And a particular time in history means that scripture will be describing certain things of that historical epoch. Now, whether everything at that time is ideal, that is open to question. So, for example, if we look at Lord Chaitanya's, Lord Chaitanya is considered to be a manifestation of Krishna who appeared 500 years ago. So, at his, his time, they are describing books like Chaitanya Charita Amrita. And describing his time that non Hindu devotees were not allowed into Lord Jagannath's temple. Now, this was not what Lord Chaitanya wanted. But that was what happened at that time. And that's what is described in the book. So, this was the description, not a prescription. So, similarly, even when Krishna descends into the world, now whatever is described, in the Srimad Bhagavatam or in the Mahabharat about the times of when Krishna was there, the, uh, the times when Krishna had descended, it was not that everything was what was prescriptive. Why not? Were in Krishna's time ideal times? Certainly not. If there are ideal times, Krishna wouldn't have to descend. The very purpose Krishna descends is because things have gone deviated. We discussed this in the fourth chapter. That paritranaya sadhuna vinashaya chidushkritam dharma samsthapana arthaya sambhavami yuge yuge. That Krishna descends to the world to establish dharma whenever those who are virtuous are sidelined and those who are vicious become powerful. And Krishna tells Arjuna, that is, that is 4, 7, and 8. And even before that, Krishna tells to Arjuna in 4, 2, 3 that sakale neha mahata yogo nashtaha parantapa. That, that ancient knowledge which I had given to you of how to connect with transcendence, that kind of knowledge has been lost over time. And I have come to you to now share that knowledge again with you. So Krishna is telling that the times when he has descended is not an ideal time. So the system of uh, discrimination based on birth to some extent was there even in the time of the Mahabharata. So Mahabharata was spoken according to tradition 5000 years ago. Mahabharata was, the events happened 5000 years ago. So now even those times are not ideal times. So when Krishna is saying that, there are, that even the low born can be elevated, so Krishna could well be stating that some people are considered low born by society but even they can be elevated. Krishna is so Krishna could be describing rather than prescribing. Krishna is not labeling and saying you are low born, but he's saying, okay, even if people are low born, even they can be elevated. The point here is that not everything in scripture is prescriptive. Prescriptive statements where especially you should do like this. That is a prescriptive statement. But you know, okay, these people acted in this way, those people acted in that way, those people did like that. So this is descriptive statements. And generally, whenever uh, we study books from another time and uh, ethos, we need to look at what are the what statements are descriptive and what are prescriptive. 
So Baldevidya Bhushan in his Vedanta Sutra commentary says that how do we know prescriptive statements? Statements which are in the imperative. Imperative means you should do like this. So for example, Krishna says, Sarva Dharman Parityajya Sharanam Braja. That give up all varieties of religion and surrender to me. That is a descript that is a prescriptive statement. Do this. But Aham Sarvasya Prabhava Mattaha Sarvam Pravartate. That I am the source of all the material and spiritual worlds. Everything emanates from me. Now this is a descriptive statement. There's no prescription in that. So now, of course, we can draw some lessons even from descriptive statements. But that, but still, their descriptive statements are not prescriptive. So now, if you look at the statement, every statement has a particular stress. Say, for example, if a tuition course, if a tuition tuition classes, they make advertisement. Even if a student has low IQ, this course can still ensure that that student will ace the exam. Now here the point is not that the student has low IQ. The point is even if the student has low IQ, still this course is competent enough to ensure is to ensure that the student aces the exam. So similarly, nine nine thirty two, not nine thirty three actually thirty two, that even if people are low born, bhakti can still ensure that they attain the highest perfection. The stress here is not that people are low born. The stress is. That even if people are low born, still bhakti practice can ensure that everyone gets elevated. So that is the point of this verse. Now, if you move further, but still we may say that okay, even if certain people, whether people are certain classes of people are called as low born or not, still Krishna refers to some people as low born. Isn't it so? Whether low born is a describer for Vaishya Shudra's women or not, but can people be considered low born at all? Well, <clears throat> no. It is where we come from determines where we are, not where we go or where we can go. What this means is that. We all have a history, a backstory. If you understand that each one of us is a soul, then the soul's journey doesn't begin from this life. The soul has a backstory, and that backstory determines our starting point. So, as we discussed, that birth itself is is discriminatory. Some people are born with high IQ, some people with low IQ, some people are born physically. Fit and healthy. Some people are born with born with sicknesses. So the so where we are is determined by where we came from. That's just a fact of life. And based on certain parameters, say the the ancient society that the Bhagavad Gita describes, that considered spiritual growth to be the primary purpose of life. And therefore, uh, it classified people based on how naturally inclined somebody might be towards spirituality, based on their birth. So, um, people who are intellectual, they may naturally reflect on life's deeper truths. And thus, by metaphysical uh, reflection, they may be more inclined towards spirituality. So, people who are more involved with, say, the physical work, they may not be so interested. In so, they may not be so naturally inclined toward metaphysics. So, here, if a hierarchy is mentioned, and some people are considered low born, the point here is that that does not that does not deny them of their essential spiritual identity that just simply acknowledges that the current body that they have it has certain inclinations which are suited for spiritual growth and some which is which may or may not be suited for spiritual growth now here the question may come if we say that certain bodies are not suited for spiritual growth then doesn't it determine where we can or can't go well, it depends on which spiritual path we are talking about. 
the bhagavad gita's ninth chapter is to stresses bhakti now there were other paths in the vedic tradition such as the paths of karma and jnana which we have discussed somewhat earlier so these paths so karma for example the path of karma involved performing a lot of rituals and that required ritual purity so <clears throat> that's why people who were low born <clears throat> they may not be qualified with that ritual purity or the path of jnana requires a lot of intellectual analysis and people who are not intellectuals may not be qualified for that path but the path of bhakti is universal if somebody is an intellectual they can practice bhakti and they can analyze the scriptures very deeply somebody is more physically inclined they can do physical services for krishna and they can also grow spiritually so bhakti is inclusive because it does not focus on any extraneous abilities it focuses primarily on the heart it focuses on the essence of who we are the soul the soul has a natural longing for the for or to love and be loved and that longing can be directed toward krishna so where we come from it does not determine where we can go especially with respect to the bhakti path the stress of this verse is not that people are low born but that bhakti is so powerful that it is universal that it can be universally adopted by everyone and everyone can become elevated and for the path of bhakti now we can have two distinct ways of looking at it that krishna is all pure and we are never so pure that we can practice bhakti so we are never qualified for bhakti at the same time we are never disqualified from bhakti so we may be unqualified but not disqualified disqualified means not allowed to participate itself unqualified means we may not have the purity of the heart we may not have love for krishna right now but the propensity to love is there and even if the, that propensity is presently misdirected krishna still allows us to enter into his circle by begin, beginning the process of redirecting our love toward him so from a bhakti perspective we could say that we are all unqualified because all for all of us our love is misdirected away from krishna but we all can become qualified in the sense that krishna's mercy by which he allows us to practice bhakti is our qualification so so krishna is mentioning of the word low born is not to label people but it is to glorify the potency of bhakti so now how does how is equality to be applied in real life this is itself a whole class but let's look look at the i'll look at this briefly so we discussed about you know in modern society there have been broadly three conceptions or rather two conceptions if you consider the pendulum in two extremes capitalism and communism so capitalism it stresses that people are different and say for example some people own the means of production and so they are the factory owners in the past when especially when the industrial age was there so when the industrial age was there at that time uh, the factory owners were very prosperous and the laborers would uh, labor and get very little in return so that was capitalism and as a reaction to that communism arose and communism states the equality of all people however the fact is that as we discussed earlier not all students in a class are going to be equal so now what the spirituality or varanashram do it actually acknowledges material equality and it stresses spiritual equality so when the four when when these systems were applied into society then what was the result if you look at communism it imposes artificial material equality and the results are the talented are not rewarded how are talented not rewarded this is a summary i'll explain this a little later people tend to become lethargic and most people live in scarcity and so are dissatisfied so in communism you know it was the idea was that if wealth is equally distributed everybody will become equally wealthy or at least equally well endowed but it didn't work out there was stinking poverty for most people and those who were administrators in society they were still 
they they kept a lot of wealth for themselves as it is said of communism all people are equal but some are more equal than others some are more equal than others so in inevitably class came up of rulers and ruled now capitalism in terms of at least uh, socio economic systems within the state socio political systems capitalism seems to have won the day today it allows wealth to determine position and power in society but the problem is that wealthy exploit the needy and there is cutthroat competition there is insecurity and everybody is greedy so everybody ends up dissatisfied so varanashram what does it do it integrates the spiritual equality of people with their relative material diversities as everyone is engaged according to their natures they work diligently and happily and society gets maximum benefit so this slide is like a summary and now we will analyze this in the next remaining slides so the problem whether it is capitalism or communism or any other system is that materialism capitalism is materialism in detail communism is materialism in wholesale what do you mean retail that retail means some people become wealthy but commun communism is that the state owns all the wealth and then the state is meant to distribute but those who are running the state you know we can't always guarantee their benevolent intentions and even if a person today who is ruling the state is benevolent it's quite likely that the, with the kind of power the person has tomorrow that person may be overthrown by someone else who will be tyrannical and that's what is the history of human society although there have been brutal kings who have who have who have killed either their own citizens or other under country citizens but there is no ideology that has killed more people than communism communism led to a 100 million deaths in the 60 70 years that it was in power from 1970 approximately 1987 so in china and russia the 100 million is more than the first world war second world war and all the wars combined together and these were the communist government only decided all those people who didn't fit into their ideology they were they were killed one by one just like germany had concentration camps uh, russia ussr had gulags and people were sent to these gulags to die so to, now how is equality to be implemented in real life so we'll discuss it at four levels equality of identity ability opportunity and results so equality of identity yes ability no opportunity yes results no let's be what i mean by this this is also like a summary of the remaining slide now equality of identity if we consider we inherently believe that everybody is equal but if you look at any is this simply sentimental because if you consider any metric for analyzing people assessing people people are different no can, can all are all people equally expert at earning money no so people are not even equal at counting money if you have currency notes some people count very fast some people count slowly as we discussed not all people are equal at iq or at physical strength or physical skills so no matter what material metric we use for assessing people we'll show that people are different they're not equal so yet we believe that everybody is equal so our longing for equality points to our spirituality we are equal because our essential identity is non material there is a spark of the divine within all of us we all have a non material essence that is equal so there so our equality is an identity at a foundational level at a spiritual level now if you consider equality at the level of ability that is simply a lie why a lie because we discussed this you know that in a class not all students will have the same iq and athletics different athletes will run at different speed so now when there are different abilities if there's a hierarchy based on ability that's not inequality that is actually a hierarchy which is good for everyone so if we are to write a say a, a good wishes or a farewell message to someone on behalf of a group now we could say anybody can write but somebody is a good calligrapher if they write that's the best for everyone no it is a pilot who should fly a plane not an untrained passenger <clears throat> now we may if we consider this point of equality you now we may all talk about equality in principle 
but nobody actually operates based on indiscriminate equality and we see this most graphically in terms of looking for a if uh, forming our relationship say when we want to want a life partner do we say all people are equal just let me pick up anyone no we don't so we consider various parameters and when we are considering various parameters what are we doing we are actually choosing now choosing is a positive word but choosing involves discriminating if you want to use a provocatively negative word if we choose someone we are rejecting other people isn't it so we cannot simplistically bring equality from principle to practice there has to be a well thought out system for bringing that out so now what about equality of opportunity that should definitely so we can we don't have equality of ability because people are differently able but equality of opportunity has to be there if there is discrimination as a official policy then that is toxic so for example if people are considered guilty because of their skin color when they come in front of the law that is horrible or if somebody is considered dumb because they belong to a particular race or community that would also be discriminatory so everybody needs to be given equal opportunity to grow and ultimately this equality is provided at the spiritual level by bhakti that whatever be one's background everybody can grow spiritually without any discrimination by practicing bhakti now what about equality of results we can't have equality of results why because actually it is disastrous it will lead to incompetence now all students if in others in in soviet russia they tried this that they said let why should we have discrimination among students so let all students get equal marks but irrespective of how they perform in the exams the result of that was disastrous because the students who were good at studies they said oh, well if you're not going to be rewarded why should we study and the students who were anyway not very good at studies they thought that even without studying they are going to get some average marks so why study again so everything got degraded so in terms of results if the results are based on competence that's not necessarily a bad thing in any society some people need to become wealthy first before everybody can become wealthy say for example how did com now computers or smartphones are so widespread but initially when these were made if the mandate had been let this be available for everyone well we didn't have economies of scale initially so there are some people who were wealthy who got computers there are some people who got smartphones and then as they were bought and they were used then the manufacturing process got uh, accelerated became more efficient and then it was made for everyone so if we try to impose equality of results in society that is just not going to work so we can't have artificial equality uh, in terms of results there will be diversity in results but if there are different hierarchies and people are given the sense that you, know, you can climb up a hierarchy that is suited for you and you have different people have different definitions of success so then what will happen is that people won't feel discriminated against if everybody is rated based on say uh, how much money is in your bank balance then uh, how much bank balance do you have then 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 that's just one hierarchy we can't have everybody being judged by one hierarchy so people's net worth can't be reduced to their people's self worth can't be reduced to their net worth or their gpa it has to there have to be different parameters so we can't have equality of results so inequality of results is not always because of discrimination it can be because of ability upbringing culture so many factors come into play so the idea is rather than imposing equality in artificial way we have it in a organic way where everybody has equal opportunity to grow spiritually so whether we are now we can't immediately change the society we are born in but whether we are born in an equal society or a discriminatory society bhakti spirituality can always give us the strength the facility to grow to our best and find enduring fulfillment so i'll summarize what i spoke today i spoke on the topic of caste system and social justice 
as this in the Bhagavad Gita. So we talked about the caste system. Uh, the purpose was not discrimination but cooperation. And the idea is of the social body. Every part is not equal in in its uh, in isolation, but uh, the body itself doesn't exist in isolation. The body exists for a function, and every part is of value provided it, it we find what is its value. So similarly, ca uh, the caste system is obviously not equal because birth itself is discriminatory, and different people have different abilities. So rather than claiming that everybody is equal, we find where people can contribute in a way that is of value to society. And, it is, and if there are different hierarchies rather than one definition of success for everyone, then people are protected from the canker of social jealousy. And they can have a sense of belonging to other people who are like-minded, like who are, who are similarly endowed like them. Then birthright made it wrong. So birth can help in gaining qualification, but birth itself is not the qualification. And then we discussed about is this scripture, is this verse talking about discrimination? And is it says, is it the word Papa Yonaiha, low born? So we discussed about how uh, first that Papa Yona could refer to a separate category, not a describer of the three categories. And then further, everything in scripture is not a teaching of scripture. Scripture may have prescriptive statements, but it also may have many descriptive statements. And then we have to also, when looking at a statement, not just look at a statement, what is the stress of the statement? So even if a student has low IQ, they can by this course ace the exam. So the stress is not on the low IQ of the student, the, the stress is on the, uh, the power of the co efficacy of the course to uh, help the students ace the exam. So similarly, the Bhagavad Gita is stressing the potency of bhakti, not the status of, of some class of people but are some people low born well we we do have a backstory we do have a history and what we have done does determine our starting point in this life but it doesn't determine our ending point so that is up to us how we act and there are certain paths which involved like the path of karma and jnana they require ritual purity or intellectual intellectual uh, perspicacity and in those parts, uh, certain certain kinds of birth may be may not be the best qualifications. But bhakti is universal; it enables everybody to grow, not just grow, but grow towards the life's ultimate perfection. And then we discussed about equality in principle and practice. So at four levels, we discussed how communism and capitalism, both of them have their problems because at the base, both of them are materialistic, and capitalism, materialism in retail and communism is materialism in wholesale. So we discussed equality in identity. It is yes, when we understand our essential identity is spiritual, our very longing for equality points to our spirituality, then equality in ability is just not true because different people are differently endowed. And equality in opportunity, yes, society through social justice should seek equality in opportunity seek to establish equality in opportunity and uh, i didn't mention this elaborately it is social justice is complemented by spiritual justice when we understand how we are equal in identity that social justice if it is not having a spiritual foundation then it can't give any metaphysical basis for its claim that society should be equal how are we equal when every material metric shows that we are different so that equality is not just a sentiment, but it is grounded in reality when we understand that our identity is spiritual. So social justice in terms of establishing the equal identity of all people and creating systems where people have equal opportunity, that is good. But if social justice starts claiming that we should have equal results, then that can be disastrous. So we recognize that whatever be the nature of society and however much we are able to change or not change it, we all can access the spiritual equality of bhakti and thereby bring out our best and find life's best fulfillment. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So I've heard different things that sometimes that it's not that any teacher is a Brahmana. 
there's only some teacher who is teaching about god is a brahmana uh well a lot depends on what context in which certain statements are made we see in the bhagavatam there is a story of bali maharaj and shukracharya and shukracharya is considered to be a brahmana and even lord vishnu who comes as vamanadev he also respects him as a brahmana and yet shukracharya gives bali maharaj advice not to surrender to vishnu and the bhagavatam does not say nor does vishnu say that because of the shukracharya is no longer considered to be a brahmana so it is that the idea is that in the vedic tradition those who were considered to be uh those who were considered to be we could say trained in vedic knowledge they were considered brahmanas now vedic knowledge had both a material and a spiritual aspect to it and much of many of the fire sacrifices that were performed in the past they were actually like sophisticated technology there was uh, there was some invocation of the gods and uh, seeking of blessings so in that sense we could say that it was it was uh, there was some amount of religion in it but essentially it was like technology in terms of function and that's why we see in the vedic times that even demons like ravana had his own whole class of brahmanas ravanas brahmanas in lanka were called as yatudhanas so when ravana went to fight with ram these brahmanas they are performing yagya for him now from absolute point of view we might say they are not brahmanas is fine but the absolute perspective is not what it is or what was always present in history so if you want to say that most of the people who were brahm who were brahmanas throughout history were not brahmanas then if one wants to do that kind of historical revisionism to fit a particular definition one is free to do that so there is a, ideally speaking the brahmanas should be uh, if they study the vedas then they should come to know about god and they should devote themselves to god uh, so brahma janati iti brahmana that is one definition of brahmana that is a we could say ideal definition of brahmana that brahmana should know brahman but if you look at the bhagavad gita itself which gives a qualification of brahmanas shamo damasta pahshaucham shantirarjam meva cha gyanam vigyanam astikyam brahma karma swabhavajam so here there is no brahma janati is established over here here what krishna says essentially is that actually they they have some self control they have a peaceful mind they they are able to perform austerities they maintain cleanliness they they have knowledge they have they they know how to use that knowledge and they have astikya refers not so much to faith in god theism as it is translated now but refers to faith in vedas so in the potency of vedic knowledge they might have faith in the potency of material knowledge in the vedas also and still they are considered brahmanas so so are teachers who teach some material knowledge or expert in material knowledge are they considered to be brahmanas well definitions of words are are sometimes uh, relative to context but if you want if you consider that there are innate inclinations and people work according to certain inclinations so it could very well be that uh, somebody might love to teach physics and somebody might love to teach um, teach art or teach some other field and they really delight in that teaching they are not into it for money they are not into it for fame they just they just delight in teaching so to say they are not brahmanas because they are they are not devoted to god you know that is imposing an extraneous qualification on a system based on one's own perspective so varanashram itself is not bhakti and some people especially those who are teachers of bhakti might not understand the difference between the two and try to present varanashram from a bhakti perspective Just fine, which is one way of looking at one nation. So basically, we didn't have so much time to go into it. But there were 
we can see there are three kinds of varnashram there was what is called as the traditional or varnashram or vedic varnashram then there is asuri varnashram and there is daivi varnashram so vedic varnashram was what was present traditionally in vedic society and that was brahmana kshatriya vaishya shudras they all engaged in their different social roles and they gradually became elevated and in that the idea was if a shudra performs now in the vedic varnashram even in vedic times not everybody was a devotee people were doing karma people were doing jnana and some people were doing bhakti so in the vedic varnashram when somebody did the duty of a shudra dutifully throughout their lives then they would be eleva elevated and they would become a vaishya in the next life and then they would become a kshatriya in the next life then they would become a brahmana and then they would become elevated uh, further higher so that was the idea of elevation so, however within the bhakti understanding it doesn't have to be like this it can be like this that means brahmana brahmana brahm kshatriya shudra vaishya brahmana kshatriya but if they practice bhakti from wherever they are they can become spiritually elevated and liberated so vaishya shudra doesn't have to become a kshat rise up the varnashram system to ultimately become a devotee and transcend so vedic varnashram focused on it was a social arrangement which was not necessarily directly devotional then asuri varnashram or demoniac varnashram was when that vedic varnashram got distorted and everything was based on birth and daivi varnashram is what our acharyas have conceived and that is that whatever be that society needs to be organized in some way and varnashram is the way krishna has described in the bhagavad gita so if everybody is devotionally inclined and everybody can be engaged according to their nature then they can be happily contributing to society and they can also be growing spiritually so we have to be clear what we are talking about so within a daivi varnashram everybody should be a devotee and if somebody is not a devotee then uh, then uh, they will not be considered brahmana within the daivi varnashram system but if we consider varnashram to be like a organic division of society present in every society according to inclinations then there will be people who will be teachers and even if they are not theistic they will be considered to be brahmanical if that's their inclination their vocation so is varana based on nature not intelligence so is it that if somebody likes to read they are brahmanas well not just read we have to consider what somebody is reading also that uh, it's not it's, it's not that Uh, say vaishyas or shudras don't have intelligence everybody has intelligence but it's a specific kind of intelligence so now there are there are so many people who read books but some people may just love to read fiction how many people who read actually books that are meta that are about metaphysics or about higher realities of life so the idea is not that one varana is intelligent and another varana is not intelligent there are different kinds of intelligences and each for any person to do a particular activity they require intelligence in that activity so somebody who is skilled as an artisan they have sharp intelligence okay you know this wood is suitable if if i am going to make some wood craft this wood is suitable this wood is not suitable just by looking at it they know it so that's expertise so we can't deny that so when when we talk about the word nature it's definitely not as simple as intelligence intelligence is one aspect of nature and uh, it's not just that brahmanas are intelligent everybody is intelligent but if we want to talk about intelligence in terms of uh, uh, in terms of information in terms of information processing ability in terms of specifically analytical ability with respect to life's deeper truths intelligence in terms of being able to specifically to take the role of a minister or a teacher or a mentor or a, or a priest then that's a particular kind of intelligence and that which involves learning and assimilating and analyzing and teaching that's the brahmanical intelligence so yes everybody has intelligence and nature involves much more than intelligence well krishna's purpose is not to yes uh, that krishna's purpose is not to mention particular demographics otherwise he would have just mentioned low born and not mentioned demographics yeah my point is that 
what is the stress of the verse the every statement has many can have many points within it but what is the main point what is the stress if i give the example of it's a rhetoric it's a statement even if so and so still so and so so there even if is not the emphasis still is the emphasis so similarly in this verse yes there there is low bond and there are three classes of people that i mentioned but the point of the verse is not that these people are low bond the point of the verse is that even they can be elevated so most of my family in say taiwan we all got into a a rated university and many of them have become but when we came to the west then we pursued our we also got into ivy league universities but then we followed our dreams and i became a yoga teacher does that mean we are brahmana solely because of intellects and have the intellectual capacity to learn or have we become shudras if we are doing occupations which are not research or study related okay um there are two three different things over here varnashram was a form of social division uh, that was present traditionally in society when society was structured in a different way today society is structured in a different way so i really don't know whether bringing the specifics of that classification into today's society is valuable or is even relevant the principle is that there should be compatible engagement of people that everybody be engaged according to their nature that principle is what is important so shila prabhupada when he talked and said that people people become devotees then you know the devotees don't belong to any particular varana that was one way he looked at it and beyond that in today's world when prabhupada talked about establishing varana ashram he basically talked in terms of attributes and qualities he did not focus so much on labels of like who would belong to which varana so is it that some people say that uh, if somebody takes a salary then they're no longer a brahmana well i haven't seen anything like that explicitly in scripture shwavritti that is the word used shwavritti is simply the attitude of a dog that is of a now there is nothing specific about earning a salary over there and i know people in various vaishnava traditions and various non vaishnava traditions also monistic traditions where they are still they are having jobs and still they are considered to be brahmanas in their community and respected brahmanas they do priestly worship they do they do rituals they teach they do various things so i in my understanding nature of a person has to be understood carefully considering multiple factors no if we consider a varanashram the whole principle of varanashram is understand people's nature and engage them accordingly so now can people's nature be assessed solely by the education that they have got can it be assessed solely by the profession that they have well not solely by any of these things we have to consider that even when krishna says guna karma vibhagasya ha qualities and activities if somebody says okay but what do we mean by activities now there are people who might be in educational professions say there might be somebody who might be a professor in a university but sometimes even in academia there can be extreme ambition and envy and politics and is that really brahmanical then somebody is uh, opportunistically scheming and plotting to pull other people down and things like that well is that environment may not really be considered brahmanical so somebody might be doing business but if they do a, if they are doing very business ethically consciously then are they really just vaishyas 
so or somebody might be doing some work or somebody might be doing some physical work or some work of artisanship but there are different ways in which somebody can do it somebody might take a lot of pride in their work and do their work well somebody might just do the work so that they can earn a lot of money so now is it that just one uh, one particular activity can be used as sole parameter for determining one's nature no not necessarily this is this is a temptation on any you could say when we try to live any wisdom tradition the temptation it's a big temptation to reduce the complexity of spirituality to the simplicity of bullet points to reduce the complexity of spirituality to the simplicity of bullet points simplicity of bullet points means that okay if you're doing this 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 then you're spiritual if you're not doing this this you're not spiritual so similarly this is a complex system of classification based on individual nature and one's profession one's uh, uh, one's qualities one's abilities all these are indicative of one's nature but none no, not no one thing can be considered as an exhaustive determiner of one's nature in fact if we start using the parameter that somebody is taking a salary because of it they are not a brahmana then bhakti sudan so thakur himself at one time he was he was working with the king of manipur and he was getting a salary so was he not a brahmana then well he was not a brahmana by birth but he was more than a brahmana by his spiritual stature so this temptation to reduce complex things to simple one point determiners that is a that is a temptation which we need to resist so one last question now when krishna was present at that time there were it is said when he came to dwarka there were prostitutes so why were prostitute if krishna is present why should prostitutes be present at that time oh uh, okay so now you know there is a temptation for those of us who study scripture within the tradition to to imagine the past to be like a utopia to romanticize the past and conversely we might demonize the present but life has always been messy throughout history throughout history the world the material world is still the material world and the material world there are always existential challenges and there are different ways in which people deal with existential challenges so we need to avoid the temptation to romanticize the past now we may for example talk about the four regulative principles but it is described in the scripture say for example about maharaj ranti dev prabhupada says in the first canto that although he was a kshatriya he never ate meat now what does that we mean that means kshatriyas would normally eat meat so now why would they eat meat now certainly they did not have organized slaughter houses where millions of people were raised to be killed but kshatriyas are warriors and if warriors are going on a military expedition and they have to fight wars and on the military expedition there are no farms available and uh, kshatriyas cannot just uh, uh, at that time the farms were not considered to be like the kshatriyas can just plunder farms for their own good so if they are in an area where there is no um, no proper food available when they are going on a war expedition now sages who are living in forests and they are performing spiritual activities they can live simply on fruits and grains but warriors have to fight so warriors would hunt and they would eat meat so now meat eating was a part of their diet it was not um, it was not like a staple of their diet as it is now for many people every meal has meat practically so we shouldn't romanticize the past and think that everything was the way we imagine krishna conscious society to be so meat eating was a part of vedic culture in fact there are so many scriptural statements which talk about meat eating but was it a recommended part was it a glorified part no of course not it is just a functional reality and now as far as prostitutes are concerned 
Prabhupada also writes elsewhere in in the Bhagavatam that that in society there are different kinds of people, and we can't artificially imagine that everybody will be self sense controlled. So, if people are not sense controlled, then what is going to happen? They need some channel by which uh, their they, their desires can be gratified. So, if that channel is not there, then they are going to go about um, uh, forcibly trying to violate or corrupt uh, corrupt uh, respectable members of society. So now, why were there prostitutes? Yes, everybody has different uh, backgrounds. Now, either that background can refer to some situation in that this life. Or it can refer to a situation from a previous life. We don't know that. We are not meant to judge people. The Bhagavatam talks about Pingala in the 11th canto. And Pingala is a prostitute. And still she is described as so wise. That when, when a particular experience comes in her life, she becomes detached. So now that doesn't, now is it that in one moment she became detached? Well, she had some knowledge in the past and that knowledge fructified at that time. So... In the Bhagavatam, there is a mention of a particular uh, Vyadha. Vyadha is a butcher. And that butcher is considered to be so wise that that butcher gives knowledge to a sage. In fact, there is a whole, whole composition in the Mahabharata called as the Vyadha Gita. So there is this renunciate, there is this sadhu who thinks I am so proud, he's very proud of being a renunciate. And there's a whole story that he goes to a home and he asks, uh, he expects the lady of the house to give him some arms. And she says, I'm taking care of my household responsibilities. Wait for some time. And he feels annoyed. You know, he says, no, I'm, a, you know, I'm due, uh, this is my responsibility in society to take care of my family. So she takes care of her family and then she comes and serves him food. And before that household, before that, uh, that sage, that renunciate has come out. You know, he, uh, he has used or misused his power. He gets angry uh, at a bird which is making a lot of noise. And he just glances at that bird and bird's wings catch fire. He thinks, I'm so powerful. He's proud of that. But then this lady tells him that, uh, no, I'm not like that bird whom you can burn by your anger. I am a virtuous, responsible, duty, dutiful lady and I have the power of my chastity. So he's surprised, not only that she's so assertive about her position, but also that she knows about it. So she says, how do you know about it? Then she tells him, you go to this butcher and you learn from him. And then he's shocked. He says, I cannot even go to a butcher. He says, no, he's a wise person. And then he goes to the butcher and the butcher speaks a lot of philosophy to him. And then the sage recognizes that I should not label people. This, he's not a sage, he's basically an enunciate. Not all renunciates are sages. Uh, so he, he recognizes that I cannot label people based on externals. Now, in the Vyadha Gita, it is described how people may circumstantially be engaged in certain professions, but that doesn't define who they are. So even if somebody, some woman is a prostitute. So, the, so in the Bhagavatam, again, like this verse statement, and even if people are low born, still they can also, by devotion, by be perfected. So the Bhagavad Gita is talking about that same principle here. That the Bhagavatam is talking about the same principle that even if some woman might be a prostitute, still she also is attracted to Krishna, and that attraction to Krishna is her is her, is what is going to spiritually elevate her. So we do try as much as possible to reorganize. Uh, our social professions or social roles in a way that they are as spiritually compatible as possible. But we shouldn't label people based on their material situations that because their material situations or professions are incompatible, therefore they are spiritually fallen. The two are different things. And the Bhagavatam, there are references which are meant to radically restructure our conceptions of spirituality. So, yes, bhakti is so inclusive that even prostitutes or butchers can also be devotees. Now we may ask, shouldn't they give up those professions if they are actually devotees? Well, we don't know their full backstory. 
and the fact that the bhagavatam does not bother to tell us the back story indicates that the bhagavatam doesn't consider that back story to be that important the point is that wherever one is materially speaking they can practice bhakti and they can become elevated now of course when we are trying to share bhakti systematically there are certain standards which um, as a institution are expected for followers but we also should know that bhakti is not limited to the institution for institutions followers bhakti devi is independent she is a goddess on her own and she can manifest in anyone's heart and wherever there is devotion that is to be respected so normally there is a system where those who want to grow spiritually they should try to make their material lives in a rearrange their material lives in a way that is harmonious for their spiritual growth but if somehow that is not happening for some people uh, they shouldn't make a they shouldn't or uh, we shouldn't label people based on the material disharmoniousness uh, as they are spiritually fallen we should see that spiritual inclination of the heart is different and it can transcend one's material situations so thank you very much for your thoughtful questions hare krishna bhagavad gita ki cha Thank you very much.